much know. I'm full of props. Uh, so, electronics and cosplay. There, it's a lot of people like to put a lot of lights and a lot of weird electronics in cosplay because why not, really? Uh, the main forerunner that a lot of people know is Kamui Cosplay. Uh, she has made a number of cosplays that focus heavily on lighting, uh, as well as released two ebooks specifically for putting lights in cosplay. Uh, so this is Kamui and her Protoss, I think she labeled it Protoss Sorcerer. Uh, a, she, yeah, she does a lot of, um, as we were talking before, non-canon cosplays. But uh, she, there, she said that there was about 300 LEDs in that costume. Uh, so she does a lot of LED work. So, why add electronics to cosplay? Uh, I told you, follow memes. So first off, uh, designers are assholes. They like to put lights on everything, including people's nipples. Uh, as can be seen for Kill a Kill here. Uh, it's also just a good skill to have because, you know, doing circuit work light is nice. Light up nipples is good. <laughs> yes, light up nipples. No, circuit work, uh, circuitry is a good skill to have because there's a lot of things that you can easily just fix, uh, like phone cords with a little bit of soldering. So, like, you can use it for a lot of other things besides cosplay. Uh, it also makes your costume stand out in the dark, uh, especially if, you know, conventions do a lot of nighttime uh, events and you can have, you know, nighttime photo shoots and having lights in your costume really help with that uh, because, you know, you're not just in the dark constantly. Uh, moving parts are also really cool. Uh, you, you know, putting motors and servos and making, you know, like wings that can kind of go out is also a common thing, so they're really cool. Uh, and, you know, it, it really just comes down to lights and electronics are really cool and they make a costume kind of stand out among the rest. So, the basics. Uh, if you aren't shuttering now, you probably will be later. Uh, that is a circuit of... Uh, drawing and it is probably incredibly com complicated uh, even if you don't know even if you do know it it probably is unnecessarily complicated so don't worry about that right now I am not going to teach you that that is not worth it it's I mean if you really want to get into it later that's a whole other ball game but it's not important this is just the basics so the basics of a circuit is all a circuit has to be is a power source or a battery, something that does something, usually an LED, but it can be like a motor or a servo or a speaker, pretty much anything. And technically speaking, that's it. That's all you need to have a, um, a circuit. Uh, obviously, not quite. There's a few little in-betweeny things that occasionally are necessary. But if you have a 3-volt LED and a coin battery, you can literally just stick the coin battery between the LED and it'll just light up. Uh, so that's all you technically need, but naturally in costumes it doesn't really work that way. So the other components you have to consider are wires, uh, resistors, switches so that you can turn your circuit on and off, uh, buttons, and a bunch of other small things uh, that can make your circuits more complicated. But those ones are the main ones. So, LED basics, because that's really what we're here for, is for LEDs and lighting, because it's the simplest circuit that you can put in a costume. So, you have two different kinds of LEDs, uh, the clear and the diffuse ones, uh, which they don't really have a good showing on the pictures that I have, but basically one of them is clear and one of them is kind of cloudy. Um, the best one is actually these two, so this one's a clear one, this one is a diffused one. Uh, they both basically do the same thing, but the clear one shines the light outward, whereas the diffused one more or less just makes the LED itself light up and kind of keeps the light from shining outward and more inward. Um, there are three main sizes of LEDs that you will find. The 3mm, 5mm, and 10mm. Uh, the 5mm is the most common. 10mm are really rare, but are basically 5mm. They're just twice as, twice as big. Uh, and 5 millimeters are also the brightest ones that you are going to find. So pretty much 5 millimeter is the one that you're probably going to want to stick with and find the most of. Now LEDs have three different components that you have to keep track of. Voltage, 
Millie Ampere, I'm probably not even saying that right, and milli, milli candela. Now, what each of those mean, voltage, is basically how much power, now, all of you physics people probably are going to yell at me because I'm definitely saying this wrong, but in layman's terms, it's basically how much power an LED takes to work. So, like, for instance, this is a 9-volt battery. It has, you know, that much power in it. Um, it's similar to strength. So, say, for instance, an LED is a dumbbell. It takes five pounds of strength to pick up that dumbbell. It's the same with an LED. So if you have a five volt LED, it takes five volts to turn on that LED. Milliamps uh, is the second most important uh, element to an LED. And it's, based, it's also known as current. And it is what I would refer to as endurance. And based, so say, say your LED is that dumbbell, a five pound, five volt dumbbell. When you pick up that five volts, Basically, your milliamps is how long can you keep holding up that dumbbell before you have to drop it. Uh, that's basically what current is uh, for LEDs, is how long can you run your, five, your battery at that, many, that much voltage to keep that LED lit. And the third one is millicandela, which is basically just how bright an LED is. Uh, it ranges from 10 uh, millicandelas to 25,000 uh, is usually the range that you'll see um, commercially, uh, whereas 25,000 is obviously the brightest. Uh, think of it as mini candles uh, is the best way of thinking of it. So a LED with 25,000 mini candela is 25,000 mini candles uh, versus 10 mini candles. So, not all LEDs are created equal. Um, so, obviously, they, those three values differ among all LEDs, and how you use them and how they can be put into a circuit varies very much based on those values. So, what do you do when your LED voltage does not match your battery? So, say, for instance, you have a 3-volt LED and you have a 5-volt battery. You have two extra volts that are going to your LED that basically your LED can't use and it'll explode. Well, it doesn't actually explode usually um, <laughs> when you do that. So you have to basically bring down that voltage so that your LED doesn't just, you know, pop and explode or not usually explode, but break. Uh, so you need resistors. Resistors basically are little, little things that you attach in your uh, uh, circuit that lower the resistant, uh, lower the uh, voltage as well as the um, the current, so that your battery doesn't overpower your LEDs or whatever you are working with. Now, there is a little bit of math. That is the simplified version of the. Uh, um, God, I, been, I have not been in school, uh, of the formula to calculate how much resistance you need so that you don't overpower your LEDs or whatever it is you are working with. So in this case, or specifically in this one, if you have a 9-volt battery and a 3-volt LED that is running at 20 milliamps, you basically need a resistor that is going to absorb uh, 6 volts and also is running at uh, 6 milliamps. So you have your voltage divided by your current, which gets your resistance, which is 6 volts divided by 0 0.02 amps. You keep that in mind because it's, it's set in milliamps, uh, but you need to have it in amps, otherwise the calculation doesn't work. And you get 300 ohms. Uh, so you need a 300 ohm resistor put into your um, circuit so that your LED doesn't blow. Now, there are calculators online for this, so you don't have to worry. As long as you know what the values are, you can basically put it into a calculator online, and it'll spit out the value of the resistor you need, uh, because resistors are used in pretty much everything in circuits, so a lot of people just may hand it in the calculator, so nobody has to do the calculations themselves. So, there's two different types of circuits that you're probably going to be working with. Series and parallel. Now, they are two drastically different, and they are also used in very different circumstances, and I'll get to that in a minute. So, a series is basically whenever two or more circuit elements are used in the same line of wire. Um, 
So in this case, you have your 9 volt battery that goes to three LEDs connected in series. So that's the minus side goes to the plus side, and then they continue along in a string. Um, whenever you do that, the voltage of the parts is added among those. So when you have three of these LEDs that are each worth three volts, they then become three plus three plus three, so it's nine volts. So a nine volt battery will then spread those three volts equally among all of those LEDs, and you don't need a resistor to uh, counterbalance the voltage difference between a single LED and the single battery. Uh, when to use these in a costume? Uh, you should use series um, circuits whenever you have uh, three or less LEDs. This is mostly just because most batteries uh, can't power three or more LEDs consistently and for a large amount of time, especially in a costume, for very long. Uh, so you, you want to reduce the amount of strain that you can put on your battery when that happens. Now for the parallel. Basically, it's the opposite where you have an element that are set parallel to each other. Now, parallel is in quotes because it's not physically parallel. Uh, oftentimes they're in really weird changes where you can have like three elements that are parallel to one single element and you know but it basically comes down to at some point the wire splits off and you have two separate instances in your uh, in your circuit that are running uh, different elements they can be the same but they can also be different now when this happens the voltage will remain the same across both paths but the current is divided between the two, uh, and that's important, uh, both in terms of the LEDs as well as how much power you or how much power is being drained from your battery, because uh, it basically will drain your battery twice as fast. Uh, so that's why you don't want to use too many uh, too many parallel wires uh, within a circuit, because it's going to drain your battery even faster. Um, so when you use this is when you have more than four uh, LEDs uh, because if you have all the LEDs on one path you're going to raise your voltage however if you have them in um, parallel that voltage doesn't change so you're not going to need a higher voltage battery to compensate for it. So battery life. <laughs> battery life is really important especially for costumes because you're going to be wearing them around and you need to know how long all of your LEDs are going to stay lit while you are in costume. Uh, naturally, you should always carry extra batteries, but it's nice to know how long it's going to last when you're in it. And this is, there's a handy dandy formula up on the side uh, that basically can tell you how long, how much, uh, and this is where current is important because current is basically how long your circuit in how long your LEDs are going to stay lit. Um, so you Take how much milliamps per hour your battery is, which almost all of them have it on somewhere on them. Uh, I think my, since mine are really, really shitty batteries, they don't. But not that one. No, because bo both, both of them are bought from really cheap. Like I bought like a 50 pack for like five bucks from Harbor Freight. Uh, but most common batteries tend to be about uh, 5,000 milli, uh, milliamps per hour. So, in the case here, um, you know, it would be 5,000 divided by however many milliamps is used in your circuit, and then you divide that and you get how long your battery life is. So, in the example that I provided, um, if you have a battery of 400 milliamps per hour that is powering a single 20 milliamp LED, that is going to last 20 hours, just being on full blast for 20 hours, that's how long it'll last. So if you're ever building your circuits, um, it's better that you plan them out so that you can make all these calculations so that you know before you put them into a costume how much you know, current you're drawing and how long your LEDs are going to last before you need to replace your batteries. So these are some common circuits that uh, you might find in costumes depending on however many LEDs you're going to have. Uh, this is, these are just simple ones. Uh, obviously, they can get way more complicated with 
more par uh, more parallel lines as well as you know uh, more LEDs put in sequence. But these are just some basic ones. So you have your most basic, which is you know just a battery connected to one singular LED. You have one battery con connected to a two singular LEDs connected in parallel. Then you have a battery connected to two LEDs connected in series, which needs a resistor. And then three LEDs connected in series, and then, you know, so on and so forth. Um, this can be, you know, modified and changed based on your usage, but as long as you keep in, keep in mind the voltage across the, those LEDs does not go above the required values in series, uh, and your uh, current constraints are not going to drain your batteries to where you're basically going to put in a battery and it's going to die in an hour, then those are the important parts that you need to keep in mind. So, now that you know how circuits are set up, you need to know how to actually build them. And you need a bunch of tools for that. So you need wire, obviously, to connect all of your elements together. Uh, you need wire cutters or strippers. Um, electrical tape, soldering iron uh, and solder. Um, voltmeter and breadboard. Now, the breadboard and voltmeter aren't necessary. Uh, it's nice uh, to have. Uh, just because, for instance, the voltmeter, it basically can, allows you to, I don't think I brought mine. It basically allows you to put the, um, this is what a voltmeter is, it allows you to put the two, um, I know there's a, an actual word for it. It's like the prongs, 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 nodes. prongs nodes. It's, there's, nodes. A, there's an actual word for it, but basically put the two prongs at two areas in your circuit and basically see how much draw of the voltage it's supposed to be getting, uh, or how much it's actually getting versus how much it's supposed to be getting. And when those don't match up, you can be like, oh, I'm doing something wrong. Uh, and if it does match up, then great, you're doing something right. Um, and then breadboards, which is this little thing over here, just is a nice handy dandy um, little piece of plastic that has metal backing and metal slots that you can just stick wires in so that you can connect things without actually soldering them together. Um, but it's, that's more of a thing that you would get into when you're doing more advanced uh, lighting and electronics, which I'm not going to be talking about because that's a whole nother seminar on its own. So, soldering. Basically, you have your circuit plan, now you need to put it together, and you need to attach your wires to all of your different, you know, your batteries, to your LEDs. And solder is basically metal glue. Uh, you basically take two wires together, you put solder on the areas between the two wires, and you stick them together, and the solder melts when it hits the soldering iron, and goes onto the wire, and then it dries, more or less. Uh, or rather it solidifies and boom, your wires are now connected. Now, it's not a super, super strong hold. You can pull wires out of solder if you put it on uh, enough um, strength and tension on it, which is why you don't want to, you know, put them in joints wherever you're soldering things because otherwise, you know, say for instance you have an LED in your arm and you know the battery's up here in your shoulder if you're you know doing a lot of movement with it it might pull on that solder and pull it out so you have to take those constraints under consideration where you're putting things but other than that that's how you put together wires and i will be doing a demo later with my soldering iron and so now that you have your circuit say for instance you have a battery it's connected to an led and things aren't working well, now you need to figure out why they're not working, and that happens a lot. Uh, there's going to be a lot of cases where things just don't work the way that they're supposed to. LEDs just don't light up, uh, or weird sounds happen, or things catch on fire, because that does happen. Uh, although, if things catch on fire, um, stop. Uh, stop, first off, because uh, that usually means that you are putting a wire in some place that it should never have gone even considered in the first place. So. Um, so say for instance the light doesn't work, it might be a polarization issue. So basically LEDs, let me pull one out here so I can show you, if I can even get this bag open. Okay, I'm just going to rip it open. So LEDs look like this, let's 
just a basic LED, and it has two metal sticks that come off the end, and they are not even. Uh, one is slightly longer than the other one. That is the positive side. The shorter one is the negative side. Uh, at least I think I have that right. <laughs> oh, I'm fairly, I'm fairly certain is, but you know, uh, looking back on it, I'd probably make sure. But you can look online. I'm fairly certain that that's the correct one. But anyway. So you want to make sure that it's not the opposite, hence why, you know, don't take my word for it, uh, and make sure. So, you know, if your LED is facing the wrong way and your negative side is going to the positive side of your battery, it's not going to work because, you know, power can only flow certain ways. Uh, and if it's not connected correctly, it won't do it. So check those, make sure that it's actually in the right, the correct way, because uh, if it's not, then the LED won't light up. Uh, check your LEDs. Occasionally, LEDs just break. They just, they can either, you know, have short-circuited or they just weren't good when you got them. Uh, so just make sure and check that it's actually the LED working. Switch it out with a new LED or take the LED out and use it with a, something that you actually know works. Um, sometimes that's the problem. Uh, the battery. Uh, they actually do run out of power occasionally, so make sure that it actually has uh, power in it. I know, it's crazy. We, we don't have unlimited power batteries, uh, 21st century, who'd have thought. But, uh, sometimes just switching out the battery, making sure that the battery actually has power. Uh, you'd be surprised how often that is a problem, and you could be standing there for like two hours trying to figure out what's wrong with your circuits, only to realize that your batteries are out of power. Uh, if the soldering is kind of, the next thing to check is your soldering. Is your soldering good? Uh, just do it again. Uh, take it apart, use your soldering iron, break it apart, and redo it. Uh, oftentimes, solder doesn't quite adhere and make uh, electricity flow through it the way it is, which is, uh, the word for it is flux, which I'm not going to get into. It's kind of complicated. Uh, but basically, you just do it again. Uh, and hopefully that makes it work. And if there's a short circuit, which is usually whenever you turn on a circuit or connect the power, you turn on the circuit if you have a switch, and there's a loud pop. Basically, it means you blew your LED because you're either running too much power through it or your resistor isn't taking enough power out of it. Basically, something is wrong with your circuit to the point where either how you planned it isn't quite what's actually happening. Uh, which usually comes down to resist you using the wrong resistor uh, because resistors have a lot of different values and you might have just traced the wrong one. And so basically at that point you have to take your part, your circuit, figure out what component was incorrect and replace it or do it over and then replace your LED because you just blew it up and you can't use it anymore because it's broken. Uh, so a lot of times if you get a short circuit it's better to just completely start over and redo it. So, for some materials. LEDs and electronics by themselves don't look good. If I had, you know, an LED at the end of this, you know, wire and it was connected to my battery, that doesn't look good just out in the open. It just kind of looks nasty. Um, and wires, wires too, they're really ugly, unless that's of course what you're looking for, in which case they're great. Um, but you need, you need to figure out ways to disguise them. Where are you going to put them in your costume? Uh, how are you going to put them through your props so that you can get between the battery and the LEDs but not have them showing? Um, put them in your armor. Where, you know, where are you going to put them on the underside? Or include them in the details so that nobody notices them. Think about that as you're planning your circuit uh, and how long of wires you need them to be when you're making your circuit. Um, and also using different materials to bring out different effects uh, with your LEDs. So, the, for an example, clear versus diffuse LEDs. Do you want an LED that's going to shine a bright light outward from your costume, or do you want to diffuse it such that it looks like it's a dull, on your costume kind of light? Um, the best example I can think is would be like a flashlight versus like a resin gem that you want to shine and light up. Um, those are two very different uh, applications of using your LEDs. So the first material that you can use to create cool effects is plexiglass. Um, so it comes in a lot of different shapes, uh, sheets, poles, spheres, just a bunch of different things because it's plastic so they can mold it to be however they want. Uh, however, you do need power tools to cut it. It is a plastic, plexiglass, it's kind of a combination between the two. 
and it is also kind of toxic when you work with it, so you have to be a little careful. Um, but when you do have it, it light passes through it, but it can also be etched and sanded to kind of have a um, diffuse quality to it. Uh, so in this example over here, the plexiglass is mostly clear. However, somebody took a Dremel and Dremeled in a little bit of details into the plexiglass, and then the light kind of shines through those scratched areas and stops versus passing straight through the glass. Um, and you can get a lot of different effects doing combinations of those or using one versus the other. And it's also just really useful for transferring light along something and ending somewhere else. So like for instance, there's a lot of LED like swords uh, that use plexiglass to like kind of transfer light down the length of a sword. It's a thing. So another thing is acrylic spheres. It's kind of like plexiglass, but you know, it's just an acrylic plastic. They're usually quite a bit thinner and not as strong, but it, like plexiglass, it can also be sanded, dremeled, etched, uh, for clear versus diffuse style. Um, but you can also put holes so that you can put LEDs inside them, like the example on the side, so that you can kind of paint the outside, diffuse it, and then when you put an LED inside, it just looks like a glowing ball of energy uh, and things like that. So it's a lot of experimentation, but whatever style you need, you can do pretty much anything you want. Another thing is resin. Now, this one is a little bit more complicated and obviously slightly more expensive, but resin gems are not that hard to do. There's a lot of uh, basic uh, resin molds where all you need to do is buy the mold and you can just make a resin gem right off the bat. Uh, but basically what you can do is you can embed an LED in the resin as it's drying uh, so that you can then have an LED within the, the, your gem or whatever you are casting. Uh, such that when you then connect it to a circuit, you can have light shining through your resin, which can then have, you know, dyes included in it. It can be painted different colors, like uh, glass paints, so that it shines through different ways. Uh, like on the side over here, uh, there were two resin gems that the backs were then painted with um, uh, glittery nail polish. Is the one that I made up there for me? This. Yes, that's a resin gem. Yes. So this is a resin gem. Uh, I assume you used a mold that was from like a craft store? Yeah. Yeah, so it was just a mold with a craft store. Um, so you could just take your resin and then you pour it into the mold and as it's drying you suspend the LED in the resin so that as it dries, it dries with the LED inside of it and then you can use the LED for your circuits. That one does not have an LED. This one does not have an LED. So, back to what I was saying before, is you need to hide your circuits in your cosplay. Oftentimes, you have a bunch of things in your cosplay that light up, but they don't actually light up in a, you know, physically possible way. So, you need to figure out where you're going to put your batteries, where you're going to put your wires, so that the thing in the middle of your costume that doesn't have any seemingly, like, powered components to it can have power and light up. Uh, Kamui Cosplay's gauntlets over there, as you can see, are most certainly not look like they have any kind of power or uh, circuit in them. But it's all hidden behind the gauntlet here with the LED and the battery and switch up here. Which is all just, I believe she glued it in on the back. But you just need to figure out ways how you're going to hide them. Um, and that all is based on what you are working with and just how you want to do it. There's no right, or way, right way or wrong way, although there technically is a wrong way to do it by not doing it at all. But that as long as it works for you and people can't see it in the way that you were intended, there is no wrong way. Obviously, you still have to be able to wear it, uh, so you can't have wires everywhere such that you can't put it on, but you get the point. Do whatever you got to do to make it work. So there's a bunch of different resources that you can go to for simple circuits uh, as well as advanced circuits. Kamui Cosplay is by far the best one. A good portion of the stuff from this presentation is actually from her book, uh, mostly just because she explains it pretty, pretty dang well for somebody that is not actually well versed in circuitry and physics and all that jazz. Uh, so if you want more references and explanations and examples of how she does things, 
Uh, I highly recommend getting your ebook. Um, it's definitely worth it. Um, Adafruit.com is a place for more advanced circuitry. Uh, they do powered boards for you know advanced lights like you know making flashing lights and you know motors and servos. Um, but they're a good resource because they have a bunch of tutorials and blogs um, up on their website that show you how to use a lot of the stuff that they sell. Um, I put this link up here because it's the place that I have found and a lot of people recommend for finding LEDs. Um, they, it allows you to search by color, by you know voltage, by milliamps, as well as mini candela, so you know you're getting the size, shape, style, color, and brightness of the LED that you are looking for. As well, most LEDs are like, I think they're like two cents to actually get. So you can pretty much go on that website and bulk buy like 500 LEDs for like five bucks. Uh, so it's a great place to go. Uh, YouTube, also a great place. A lot of people put up um, basic circuitry videos as well as actual cosplayers that do um, videos on how they put lights in their costumes. And Google. If you don't know how to do something, Google does. Google does, I guarantee it. Uh, it may not be the most acceptable way of teaching you, but I bet it knows. Um, so use Google if you can. Um, and if not, you know, ask around. Um, reference more videos. You know, there's, somebody will know what you need to do, um, even if they haven't done the exact same thing. So, it's demo time. Woo. The bottom side has one is longer, one is shorter. Um, and since these are thin plastic, you can basically take a wire cutter and snip them off however you need to for, you know, your circuits so you don't have to, you know, have this giant long wire all over your costume. So you can snip them off after you've soldered them so that they're not as long and gangly and in the way. So, and moving on, these are resistors and very much yeah, very much in the same way that the LEDs, they have a long strand here so that you have more room to solder to. Um, and these ones are specifically meant for these, but resistors all have these colored bands on them. And this is why things are really complicated and even I am really bad with them. And those color bands basically mean very different things and how much resistance they give. Every, resi every um, resistor comes with this little handy dandy chart to show how, what, the, um, what those bands mean, but uh, frankly, they, they don't do jack shit. Um, I, can, I, I can't even decipher what these bands mean uh, or what this uh, reference sheet is supposed to mean. So it's usually better to just buy the exact resistor you need online, that way you don't have to worry about it. So like for instance with these, these are the resistors that are meant are at the correct resistance for these LEDs, so I didn't have to worry about it. However, these LEDs are also really shitty, so don't worry about it. And I'm not going to talk about them. So, the next thing is, LEDs also come in strips. So these are an LED strip that are uh, a specific color. Uh, I believe this one is the orange one, and then this one is yellow. And how LED strips work is they basically have the positive and negative that goes all the way along the strip and then all the way back. And you can snip them off at different uh, areas, which are denoted by the, um, the copper pads that you would be soldering to. And so you can basically, I don't have to bring my scissors, sadly, but these will have to do. So take, we're going to take two of these, and you can cut them off here. So now, if I attached a, the positive and negative uh, wires from my battery to here and here, it would light up the entire uh, strip. However, if I put them here and here, it would also just light up this small amount. So you can always just cut off however many you need uh, and use whatever you need. Um, most of them also have a nice plastic, or not plastic, um, rubber shield to them. Uh, this can also be kind of roughed up to kind of create a diffuse effect, 
but it's not not that good at doing it so I don't recommend it too much but it basically keeps your LEDs from getting damaged you can take it on and off um, you can also cut it so you can kind of just peel it back if you don't want to deal with it or if you know you don't really need to have the plastic cover like if it's going to be uh, inside something or if it's going to be inside of a resin gem you obviously don't want that plastic cover in there because it's just going to mess with things but these strips particularly run on 12 volts which is kind of a lot compared to most um, most LEDs singly, but um, I found that they're the most useful because they're extremely bright, as you will soon see, uh, compared to single LEDs. And you know, having a nine volt and two AA batteries somewhere on your costume really isn't that bad. Obviously, I have a uh, six pack of or a seven pack actually I think. No, it's an eight pack. Uh, an eight pack of, you know, double uh, of double uh, A batteries that is kind of, you know, heavy, it's kind of bulky, but it works. Um, basically as long as it as long as it works. So I'll show you that when you attach the negative side and also a little bit of advice, you always attach the negative side first. You don't want power flowing through it and it has nowhere to go because oftentimes when you do that you're going to blow your LEDs um, because the power has nowhere to go so it just kind of pops and explodes. Uh, so you attach your negative side first so that when you finally attach your power it has somewhere to go and it goes back to the battery. And I will turn this on and oh switch these. I forgot that these are both bad, uh, black cords. So, and, boom, ta-da. Shiny. Shiny. So that's all you technically need is the ability to just, you know, have your LED get to your battery. It doesn't have to be, you know, fancy. It doesn't have to be anything crazy. Um, and I can do it with the smaller, or the yellow one to show you that it is a different color. And these strips also come in different sizes, um, different lengths, um, and different colors. You do have to be careful though, because if you're trying to do simple stuff, uh, you don't want multicolor lights because those need a um, a data signal to work. Uh, and obviously, this thing isn't sending a data signal; it's only sending power. Um, and so, you need to make sure that you don't buy an RGB. Um, light strip, otherwise you're, it's not going to work. So, you have to code that. And you have to code that. So, putting these ones on, and boom, ta-da, there's, oop, sooner or later I'll get these lined up correctly, there we are. Yeah. yeah, doing it by hand is great for testing, but obviously, you know, it doesn't work for actually doing it. So, boom. That's the whole strip, and obviously this thing can power the whole strip because the other reason why I like the strips over is the single LEDs. One, you don't have to worry about resistors. You just worry about what the voltage is. Um, however, and, oh, not however, you also don't have to worry about the fact that as these are connected, uh, you don't have to worry about actually wiring between all of your individual IDs, uh, LEDs, and you can technically cut off a strip here and then cut off another strip and connect them with wires and they'll still connect in the same way. You don't have to add any more resistors, you don't have to change your voltage. It's just really easy to work with comparatively. Now, the only problem is these draw way more power than your normal LEDs. So I was only ever able to get like, I think it was like five or six hours worth of a 12 volts of battery. Uh, in a lot of the costumes that I've used these in because of the fact that they draw so much power versus some of the costumes that Kamui has said that even though she has like six or seven LEDs on it, uh, she can wear or turn that costume on for like 27 hours before the battery runs out. So, you know, there's drawbacks and there's positives. It's really up to what you want to do. Um, as well, batteries can be kind of expensive, um, especially down the road. Um, but I don't, if you can get to Harbor Freight, Harbor, Harbor Freight sells these AA battery and AAA battery packs for like 20s 
you get like 20 of them for like four dollars so I highly recommend going to them rather than going and buying like six of them at Walgreens for like eight dollars so to show you a little bit of soldering the start basically what you want to start with is where I'm going to connect these in series because I want 12 volts so that I can light my LED strip so when you connect power uh, or batteries in series you need to connect the positive side to the then negative side of the next battery because uh, if you connect the positive side to the positive side the energy is just not going to flow anywhere so the first thing that you got to do is you have to strip the wire the or the wires rather that you are going to be working with and it can kind of be a pain so that you make sure that the wire is nice and exposed in a decent amount of space um, obviously it's personal preference how much you want to use I prefer to overdo it because you can always you know cut back on the wires and you then cover it with you know things like electrical tape uh, or um, a lot of more well I wouldn't call them advanced but uh, more official uh, circuitry making uses uh, shrink wrap tubing uh, to make sure that your solder doesn't let go and is covered but anyway the next thing you do is then you want to physically connect them before you solder so you have the two wires that are going to be done and I like to do the fold back technique a lot of people do other things some people do the twist technique where you take the wires and you twist them around each other uh, I personally prefer the fold back technique because one is also just really good for testing so you can basically take the end of the wire you bend it back and then you bend the wires around each other to make kind of this like finger hold so that you know they're nice and snug and they're not going to pull back on each other if you know something goes weird as you're soldering. Now the next thing you have to do is then you have to actually solder it. Now a lot of people have, uh, you're supposed to have something that like keeps it up because obviously people don't have like four hands to be able to do this and then solder it at the same time. So there are things that you can buy that are basically like alligator clamps that you can use to hold up the wires that you are trying to solder together. Um, I know Kamui Cosplay literally just cuts a hole in a duct tape thing so that you can literally just sit them in the slot as she <laughs> solders, but it doesn't really matter. So the next thing that you want to do is you take your solder, uh, which comes in this nice roll, and the, once your soldering iron is hot, it then basically slowly melts your solder, and it becomes, you know, this like metallic blob. And then you go and take it to your wire, and you just kind of solder it on, and you just kind of glue it. Mm -hmm. And then after a while, that solder will harden. Caution, hot metal is yeah. hot. And boom. Yeah, it's cool. now fully solid. Yeah. Now, obviously this is a little hard to show you because there is good solder and there's bad solder. Uh, this is moderately good solder. Uh, so solder, it also varies on how much solder you have, but most solder is supposed to look shiny and look kind of like aluminum. Um, it's supposed to look good. Uh, however, if it looks dull, if it looks like there's, you know, pieces of it and it's not, it just doesn't look, it looks like metal that it's been out for a long time. You probably, it's probably what's known as a cold joint. Uh, and it doesn't let electricity flow as easily. You'll probably want to redo it until it is nice and shiny. This one is mostly shiny, so I'm probably okay. This is another reason why I like to do the, um, the fold-over technique, because even if you have a cold solder joint, uh, a lot of times since you did the fold-over technique, the wire is already touching each other, and you, your solder is basically just extra, um, extra connection to make sure that it doesn't like fly apart. So, now that these have been connected, we're going to test it on the uh, battery, or the LEDs, to make sure that the power is actually flowing between these two batteries at the right voltage. And it is. Yay. So, that's the basics of just soldering wires. Um, and you do basically the same technique for anything, uh, be it for, you know, LED strips or actual LEDs, wires to batteries, although... 
since we're LED strips are a little different because of the fact that they're flat and they're not like an actual wire so you can't like wrap them around each other and then solder on top of it so you have to figure out how you're going to attach a round wire to a flat surface um, and basically what you do is you pre-solder where you're going to go which means you take your solder and you basically just put a little dot on the um, copper pad I'm going to do both just to kind of do it and boom now that you have solder there uh, that is stuck like sticking to the copper um, you can then take your next um, wire that you're going to put it there and let me rearrange this And Don't solder that. <laughs> you then just kind of reheat up that solder that's already there. And you put the wire in it, pull away the iron, wait for it to cool down, and boom, fully soldered. Yay. Uh, now, this one's actually a really good example of... It's not really that big of a deal because um, it's not that bad, but you can kind of tell up close that this one is quite a bit shinier than that solder joint. And since I'm going to be reheating it, it's not a big deal, but um, that, that's what you're looking for. And usually it's a lot more drastic than that. This would still work as a soldering joint, but th that's the telltale st sign that you would be having a bad, s or the start of a bad solder joint. So I'm not actually going to solder this last one because then it's just going to endlessly... Eh. I'm going to take this off so it's not endlessly on. And then, re-solder. Wait for it to dry, and boom. Now when I reattach the battery, ta-da, ta it works. Amazing. So that means I correctly did all of the parts of the circuit. I did all the soldering correct. The batteries still are all running on full power. Now, if I had connected this and it didn't work, then then the first things you check are the things that are the easiest to check, which is, one, is your battery working? If you switch out the battery and it doesn't work, then you're okay. So you don't have to worry about the battery. The next thing you check is you look at your solder or your areas that need soldering. And you make sure that, you know, they're actually where they're supposed to be. Uh, you make sure that they're not branched together. So, like, for instance, these joints, they're not supposed to touch. If they are touching, it's not going to work because that means that the power is just going to be going this way instead of through the LEDs and back down. Uh, so make sure that your joints are not connecting in areas they aren't supposed to be. Next thing you want to do is test to make sure that your light strips or your LEDs are not or working as intended. Um, the, the best way that I do it is every time I have my circuit laid out, I solder one piece of the circuit, and then I test the, rest, test the circuit. Um, and if it works, great. Then I work, do the next piece. And if that works, great. And then I keep going until the full circuit is done. Because if any, at any point in time, something doesn't work, well, that means that the one last thing that I just did now doesn't work, and I've narrowed it down versus, oh, I'm going to solder together you know, six LEDs, the batteries, and switches all together at once, then turn it on and be like, oh, it doesn't work. Which part do I have to work with? Because you now have so many more parts to work with. Now, in terms of switches, sadly, I don't actually have one. Um, my stock of electronic stuff is uh, rather small right now because most of it went into Reinhardt. But basically, switches are kind of like LEDs in the sense that they have prongs that come down. Uh, and there's usually three of them. And then there's a switch on the top instead of an LED. And basically what you want to do is you want to solder to one of the outside prongs and then the inside prong. Because uh, how a switch works is it's basically like a U-shape uh, on top of it. Actually, I'll just draw this. It'll make it easier. Can you pull the board up? If you... No, I'll just do it over here. So imagine a switch is kind of like this. Here, you're... So you're going to want your wires here and here. The switch on top is basically just this U-shaped piece of wire that connects the prongs. So when it's one way, it connects the middle to one of the outsides, and then when it's another way, 
it then connects the other way. So that's how you want it to turn on and off, is because if you then put the wires on the outside, they're never going to connect no matter how you move that switch. So you always want one piece of that wire to be on the inside, and then it doesn't matter which side you put the other wire on as long as it's one one of the sides. Um, and then after, that's mostly just personal preference on how you want to align it, on which where in the circuit you put it, because it doesn't matter. Uh, although you usually want to put it either uh, right after or right before one of the batteries, um, just because you don't want to put it in one of your um, parallels or in one of your series, because then it's going to potentially mess with a lot of your the rest of your uh, uh, circuit, where you might turn off part of your uh, circuit, but not all of it. Um, and you usually, whenever you're putting a switch in, uh, it's because you want all of it turned off and on, because a lot of times that will mess with your voltage and your uh, amps, and can sometimes short circuit your entire circuit, and you have to start all over again. So plan that out before you deal with it. Um, so there's other things that also work. Um, so actually, I'm gonna undo this so that I can show you. I should have done this before I did this, but you know, slaughter on the floor. Yeah, it's easy to pick it up because once it dries, it just kind of becomes like a. Well, it becomes metal again, so like you can just kind of peel it up. Um, the solder. Yeah. Be careful, that is lead based. Yeah. So don't like play with it and then. No, definitely. <laughs> and don't breathe. Yeah, the fumes. don't, don't, don't breathe the fumes. Don't, you know, put it in your mouth. Don't, don't do stupid shit. Um, that's really what it comes down to. So, with with just motors, if you want a motor in a costume, so like for instance, Reinhardt's motor, I literally just attached the back part to a basic motor with the switch, and then whenever I had the, oh wait, this is the wrong one. I need this one. So. Whenever I had the motor, I, you just, luckily motors, uh, the only different, or most basic motors, uh, servos are a little different because they are a motor that is powered by um, uh, the signal from a board uh, to what position it should be, whereas most motors just take power in and power out so that they just spin endlessly. I have yet to find a motor that actually has a specific power in and power out spot because the only difference is which way the motor turns based on which way the power goes in. So if you connect the power to this side, it spins this way. If you connect it, if you flip it, then it spins the opposite way. Really, it doesn't matter unless you're wanting to put have one spin the, a specific way. But when you attack it, and then boom, it's spinning. Obviously, you can't see it, but you can hear it. Uh, but <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's spinning. <laughs> he screamed. Oh, he screamed. But yeah, so that's just how you can add motors in. Uh, it's usually not, you know, it's not hard. The problem often is just finding how you want to attach a motor to whatever you're putting on because usually they just have a post and trying to attach anything to a post and then stay on that post is almost impossible as I found out with Reinhardt. Um, but that's another option and that more or less covers the basics the only other thing that I like to talk about as a little bit of an aside um, is this thermoplastic uh, so thermomorph instamorph it's awesome beyond just the use of electronics it's really nice basically it's a bunch of these tiny pebbles uh, that you then put into a bowl and put it in the microwave for like it's like you know, 10, 15, 30 seconds, somewhere in there, until they turn clear, uh, because they're rather opaque right now. And then you take out the bowl, you take a fork, you kind of swish them together, and they form this nice ball. They kind of like melt together. And then you can basically mold them together with your hands into whatever shape you want until it cools down and it hardens back into this opaque plastic uh, and in whatever shape that you left it in. The reason I mention it for electronics is because uh, for those of you that have seen my Elias head, it is incredibly great for uh, LED diffusers. You can heat it up, make it into whatever diffuser or style of gem or out outer shape that you want your light to fill, and then stick it onto your LED. It will stay there, uh, provided you know you make sure that it actually stays within the plastic as it cools. And boom, you now made your own 
uh, diffuser in, you know, with really, really cheaply and really, really easily without, you know, having to do like resin casting or, you know, uh, plexiglass or anything like that. Um, so you can get this on Amazon. It's actually really cheap. I think this thing was only like 15 bucks. Um, so, and for Elias, for both of his eyes, I think I only used legitimately like 10 pellets. Like 10 pellets. Not just, you know, like 10 little handfuls. Like 10 of these little tiny pellets to make the entire thing. Uh, so they will last a long time. But yeah, other than that, any questions about anything? Because obviously I didn't do questions during the presentation.